Hello, my name is Adam. In this video, we are going to learn how to make Fruit Ninja in Unity. Fruit Ninja is a mobile game developed by Halfbrick Studios and was first released in 2010. The player slices fruit with a blade controlled via the touchscreen. As the fruit is thrown onto the screen, the player swipes their finger across the screen to create a slicing motion, attempting to slice the fruit in half. This will technically be the first 3D game I'll be making on my channel, but it plays more like a 2D game. It's surprisingly a fairly simple game to make, at least to get the core mechanics in place. If you need help at any point in the tutorial, feel free to join our Discord community where we can offer direct help. There's a link in the description of the video. Please consider subscribing to the channel to support the amount of effort it takes to create a video like this one. It would mean a lot to me and it helps drive the growth of my channel. Thank you, enjoy the video. Let's create our new project using the Unity Hub. In the top right corner, we can click the new project button at the very top, there's a drop down to choose which version of Unity you want to use, depending on which versions you have installed. I'll be using Unity 2020.3, which is the current long term support version. For this tutorial, it doesn't really matter which version you use, so feel free to use whichever. I am going to use the 3D template here because we're going to be using 3D models for our fruit. And then in the right, we can choose the name of our project or enter a name of a project. So I'm just going to call this Fruit Ninja. And then of course, choose wherever you'd like to save your project and go ahead and click create. This might take a few minutes to initialize, so we'll pick it up as soon as it finishes. All right, first I'm going to import some custom assets that we'll use throughout the project. If you wanna use the same assets that I'll be using, then you can download them from the GitHub repository. There's a link in the description of the video. Upon opening that repo, you should see something like this. And then there's a download link here in the readme. So we can click that. This will download a zip of the entire project. And then we can go ahead and extract this and pull out any assets that we want to use. So I'm going to look in the assets folder here and I'm going to pull in a font here, which we'll use for some of our UI. I'm going to bring in these two models here and there's two, two different models. One is a whole fruit and one's a sliced fruit. So I'm going to pull those in and let's also go into materials and textures. There's a wood texture here that we'll be using for our background. The wood texture I created using a number of kind of a combination of assets from this website, Ambient CG, which just has a bunch of public domain free assets that are super useful, all kinds of things. And then the model here is actually from Brackies. It's from one of his tutorials. So thanks to Brackies for these. There's two versions. There's a whole one and a slice one. And for the purpose of our tutorial here, we're just going to be kind of using this one model for all of our fruit. We will implement different fruit, but it's going to all use the same model. And it's just a very simple model, basically a sphere. Let me go ahead and put these into different folders to keep all of our assets organized. So I'm going to create a textures folder. I'm going to create a um, materials folder. Or not, a, we'll get to materials, but models is what I meant to say. And then we'll create a um, fonts folder. Bring those into their respective folders. I already, I already messed that up. Let's bring that back. Fonts. Okay, cool. Now, the only thing we want to change in terms of our import settings, if we click on any of these assets, we can change various settings. For our wood texture, this is a 1024 by 1024 texture. So I'm going to set the max size to 1024. And then I noticed using this texture that the it kind of visually lost a lot of quality when it had compression compared to maybe other textures. So I chose to turn off compression for this particular texture just because it, lo it looked a lot better without it. And then for our models, there's nothing we really need to change on these. These are totally fine as they come. That's it in terms of importing our assets. Next, let's go ahead and do a little bit of scene setup. So we're going to add our background into our scene as well as kind of adjust some of our camera settings. So let's go ahead and right click in our hierarchy here. This lists all of our game objects in our scene. And we're gonna create a new plane here. This will kind of serve as our background. We've got our plane, let's reset its position. It's just kind of at the origin. Now you can see from the game view here, we can switch between scene view and game view. The game view is from the perspective of our camera. We need to rotate the plane upwards. So on the X axis here, we can adjust it. We're gonna kind of just rotate this negative 90. So it's kind of looking at us. And then let's adjust our camera so it's centered properly. So it's zero, zero. And the Z can, can stay the same. I'm also going to change the size of our plane here to make sure it always covers the entire area. 
um, no matter kind of and it'll be big enough that regardless of the screen size it'll always be big enough to, to fit everything i'm just gonna make this really big and say 10. And this so you can see in our scene itself it's pretty massive i mean i guess there's nothing to compare it to so i guess it's kind of a moot point but nonetheless we got a big plane here let's go ahead and add our texture onto it to do that, we need to add a material for our wood here. So let's right click in here and create a new material. And I'm just gonna call this background. We can go ahead and drag this material onto our plane. So we can either just drag it directly onto the object in the hierarchy. We can also drag it into the bottom or this empty space at the bottom, or we can also go in the mesh renderer here. This is the actual property. Um, we can drag it in there. So any of those work. You can see our backgrounds on here. I can change the color and everything. And I'm actually going to keep the tint white, but I'm going to drag our texture into the albedo slot there. And that looks good. Now let's adjust a few other settings. For I'm going to turn the smoothness down. The smoothness is going to, you can kind of see in the preview image here, that's going to, the more smooth it is, the more light is going to potentially kind of reflect off of it. I'm just going to turn our smoothness all the way down. I'm even going to get rid of specular highlights and reflections. So it's kind of just, it's kind of basically as unlit as possible. I could change the shader to be unlit. For example, I could just do an unlit texture. The reason I don't want to actually do that in this case is because that will prevent shadows from displaying. So I actually still personally like having the shadows um, from the fruit kind of show on the background. So I like to still use a lit standard shader but kind of get rid of all the other lighting effects like specular highlights and whatnot. And now, of course, this doesn't look very good yet. We can adjust the tiling here to be a little bit more normal. So uh, personally, I kind of like something around three or four, um, up to you. Obviously, if you're using your own custom assets, feel free to just make it your preference, but this looks pretty good to me. And so that'll kind of just serve as our background. I do want to actually bring it back a little bit further. So right now it's just sitting at our origin, zero, zero, zero. I'm going to spawn all of our fruit and everything at the origin just to keep it simple. So I actually want the background to be pushed a little bit further back, right? So I'm going to just push this back by like five units and that'll be good, right? Actually helps make the texture itself look a little bit better too. You can see more. You can see on the texture is little scratch marks. I thought that was fitting for this particular game. Now for our camera here, there's a few settings we could change. It's not necessarily required, but I'm gonna do a few things here. One, I'm going to change the projection from perspective to orthographic. For this game, it doesn't really matter. Either projection works totally fine. I personally found orthographic to look just a little bit better. And with that though, we need to change the size. So I'm gonna kind of pull this out. And if we go to our scene view, our scene view, we turn on our gizmos here, you can see kind of the, this is sort of the white, white outline here is what, they're, uh, what the camera sees. As I change the size, you can kind of see how that changes. I'm just gonna double this from the default of five to 10. And that should be good. Give us kind of more space to work with. And this really doesn't matter since we're just seeing the background itself, but I don't really need to render a skybox, so I can just change this to a solid color and I can just choose the color of like just some brown color that based on our um, based on our texture here. Just in case, like for example, if I were to get rid of our plane, so I just turn this off, now I just get a plain colored background. But maybe, you know, that works for you. If you don't care about having a texture background, you can just pick a solid color and just kind of set it to be whatever you want. And that's really the easiest thing to do. But I like having the plane on there and then we'll also get some shadows on there and stuff from our fruit too. Okay, next let's go ahead and set up our fruit prefab so we can then start spawning them in our scene. Let's go ahead and right click in our hierarchy and just create an empty game object here. And I'm just gonna call this fruit. And let's reset the transform to its defaults. And let's go to our models and let's drag both of these onto our fruit here. And they should get nested. They'll become children or they'll become parented to this. Let's drag both of those onto fruit. We can kind of expand and collapse this as a whole now. I'm just gonna rename this to whole and to sliced. Sliced. So what we're gonna do in our code is we're gonna basically turn on and off these. You know, we'll start with slice turned off. You'll just see the whole fruit. And then in the scene, or once the, it gets sliced, we'll disable this one and re-enable the other one. 
Um, and let's just reset these positions and everything back to zero as well. Make sure all that's kind of at the origin. That all looks good. Now let's set up some physics components on our objects. We need physics, one, to detect for collisions, but also, you know, to have a physics simulation because we're going to kind of launch these up into the air and so on. So to do that, we need a rigid body component. So on the root parent here, on the parent object, we're going to add our rigid body. So let's search for rigid body. And this is technically a 3D game. So we'll use just a normal one here. A rigid body turns this into a physics object. Once you add a rigid body to an object, it gets part of the, it becomes part of the physics simulation. And all the default settings are actually totally fine for our purposes. You can play around with these like mass and stuff. Maybe you want your different fruits to have a different mass. It's totally fine, but the defaults work pretty well. And we definitely want gravity and things like that as well. We also want to add a collider. The collider is going to determine the shape of the collision area. So we're going to use a sphere collider. So this is sort of a spherical shape. And I do want this to be a trigger. When they're not triggers, they will physically collide with one another, which maybe you want. So you can test it out with them being physical colliders. But the problem is I found it they just sort of interfere with each other when they get launched up into the air and it doesn't lead to very good results. So when they're kind of getting launched up into the air, that would just be triggers so they can phase through one another. And that just, in my opinion, leads to much better gameplay. I do want to adjust the radius a little bit. If we go to our scene view here, you can't really see it, but if we adjust this radius, you can see this green outline if you have your gizmos turned on. And this, you know, we can visualize the collision area of this object. So I'm just going to set the radius to one so it perfectly matches this model. That looks good. So now we've turned this, our fruit, into a physics object, which is great. I also want to do something very similar to the individual halves of our sliced fruit. But at some point, we're going to turn off the whole fruit. We're going to turn on the sliced fruit. And then these individual halves will sort of be their own physics objects. So we can add rigid body and colliders to these as well. I'm going to select both of these. And I can go to add component. We'll add a rigid body. And we will also add colliders. Now, I'm going to use a box glider for these because they're just halves. Um, they ca I can't really use a sphere because then it would be the whole thing. All right, I just kind of need one. So since it has a flat, um, you know, half there or surface there, the box glider works a little bit better. So that looks good. It, it kind of by default changes the positioning and sizing to kind of match the model. So we don't really need to adjust those. Those are totally fine. And for these, we can actually keep them as non-triggers. Because I find that once you do slice a fruit, at that point, you can let all the slice, or all that sliced halves of the fruit kind of collide with one another. And it actually leads to more sort of interesting, you know, dynamics. Um, and it doesn't really affect the gameplay at all because at that point, you know, the fruit's already sliced. It doesn't matter anymore. So I like keeping them not to be triggers so they can interact with one another. And then the physics uh, or the, yeah, the, rigid body kind of physics settings here don't really matter too much. We definitely want to keep gravity. Um, I can maybe turn off drag. The drag affects sort of the rotation of the object. Um, the more drag, the, the, the quicker it will stop rotating. Same thing with the normal drag is the more drag there is, the quicker it will come to a stop in terms of its positioning and movement. So I can set drag to zero that way it kind of essentially this is going to just let it freely spin so if something causes it to spin it'll just kind of always spin at that point it'll, nothing will be able to stop it because there's not no drag to stop it which once again i think that works pretty well for this game because um, it just makes it more interesting and once you've sliced the fruit like the more kind of the more crazy it gets the, uh, kind of the more fun it is and the more exciting it is so but yeah feel free to play around with some of those so that's kind of our basic fruit setup. We'll, we'll definitely adjust some of this a little bit more later, but this is good for now. We can now turn this into a, let me actually re-enable hole. We're, we are gonna have slice disabled initially. So we wanna deactivate this entire game object and just have the whole one activated. So that is one important thing. So you, can, you should be able to sort of see it grayed out and the other one not. Now from here, we can create a prefab. So let me create a folder for prefabs. 
And all we need to do is drag this fruit object into our uh, project panel down here. And now we have our fruit prefab. I'm actually going to rename this to be fruit base. And now that we have that asset, we can delete it from our scene. Prefab allows us to kind of reuse the same sort of game object over and over and over again. Um, and we can instantiate programmatically and so on. So I can just drag a bunch of these into the scene and it's just an exact replica of that object. That's sort of what a prefab is. Now we can also create prefab variants. So we can take this and we can, let's drag it, actually add it back to our scene. And if we then drag it back into our uh, project panel, it is going to ask us, do we want to create a new original prefab or do we want to create a variant? And so we want to create a variant in this case. And this will be, for example, let's have a watermelon. So now what this, and we can now delete it from our scene or from our, yeah, from our hierarchy. So what this does is we can now override some of the properties on just the watermelon while maintaining all of the other properties from our fruit base. So for example, we want to change the material on this. Let's, let's open up this watermelon and let's change our materials. Um, first, we need to create some materials. Let's go ahead and create a folder for materials. And actually, I think we have a material, so let's drag this material in there. And let's go ahead and create a new material. I'm going to call this watermelon inside. And we're going to have a second one for watermelon outside. And on our object here, or the hole, that'll be our outside. Or the sliced, if we select both the top and bottom, there's actually two, if you expand the mesh render materials, there's actually two, and they're already kind of labeled outside and inside. So I want to drag the outside onto the outside, of course, and inside into inside. And that's for both the top and the bottom. So now if I customize, let's actually change these materials. Let me pull up what colors I used. Um, so here for our outside, I'm going to change the color to this green color. Feel free to customize it to your preference, but this is the color I'm going to be using. And I'm also going to change the smoothness here. Once again, the smoothness is going to sort of affect essentially how much light can potentially reflect off of it. The smoother it is, the more light is going to kind of um, hit it, reflect off of it. So in this case, I, I don't want it to be no smoothness. I don't want it to be super smooth though. I'm going to use something like 0.2. Kind of get a little bit of a glow. And then for the inside, let's use our red color here. Um, feel free to use the same color I'm using or customize it to your preference, but that's the color I'm using. And for the inside, since it's kind of the inside is sort of juicier, I kind of want it to be um, more, I guess it, it's actually sort of backwards in the sense that it would be rougher, so it would be less smooth, but I kind of like the way it looks when the light reflects off of it a little bit more. So I'm going to actually make the smoothest, in this case, double, so the inside looks a little bit more, I don't know, juicy. Um, if we, let's re-enable our sliced one here and let's take a look at, at what this looks like. So we, we can adjust, see that, and you can see on the inside, he's using the one, the outside using that. This particular mesh that we imported is set up to use two different materials. It has two kind of sub meshes, and so you can apply a different material to each. All right, great. So there's our fruit. That's our watermelon in this case. Let's re-switch this over. Now, so back to what I was saying before. So notice here, our watermelon, we changed the uh, materials on it, but it's still coming from the fruit base. So if we change other settings on our fruit base, let's say we wanted to make the radius bigger, that's gonna also affect the watermelon. You can see I just changed the watermelon too because that particular property we're not overriding. So it's just sort of inheriting that from the base prefab. If I change this, notice how one, there's this little blue indicator and it kind of becomes bold. This is indicating that this property is being is overriding the, the prefab that it's sort of inheriting from. You can even see in the overrides here, we can see all the things that I'm overriding compared to its sort of source. We can see I'm changing the radius and I change those materials. I actually want to revert this. Um, I, I want to revert the radius. That was just, just a demonstration. So I can right click and revert that. Uh, actually, let's go ahead and back to this. Let's set this back to one and great. 
So we can kind of repeat the same process over and over again. We'll drag in a fruit base into our scene. We'll drag it back into our panel, project panel, and we'll create a variant. And we're gonna do this for each of ours. Actually, you know what? Um, I can, at this point, it might be easier to just duplicate our watermelon. So I'm gonna press Control D or Command D if you're on a Mac to duplicate this a few times. And let's get a apple, an orange, a lemon, and a kiwi. Let's name these kiwi. We'll call this one orange. We'll call this one apple. We'll call this one lemon. Go ahead and create some materials for each of those. Um, so let's say lemon inside. Lemon outside. And same for all the others. All right, so we've got all of our materials. I'll show you what colors I'll be using, but obviously feel free to use your own. For our apple inside, we're gonna kind of use a yellowish color here. Put this to that. I'm gonna change the smoothness to 0.4. For our outside, we'll use sort of a red color again. Here's the color I'm using. Set this to 0.2. I'm For the outside, I'm gonna use basically 0.2 for everything. For the inside, I'm gonna use 0.4 for everything, but it's totally just preference. Let's do our lemon, our lemon here. That's the color for the outside. Here's the color for the inside. And let's do our orange. Oh, and I forgot to change these. So let's do 0.4 for the inside, 0.2 for the outside for our orange. Set the color here, that's our outside, 0.2. Our inside, 0.4. And our color. All right, and then our kiwi. Kiwi outside. Now for the kiwi, the kiwi definitely does not have a smooth surface at all. So that one I'm just gonna set to be zero for the outside. I think it looks way more accurate to what a kiwi looks like. That's the color I'm using for the outside. And then the inside, of course, will be a lovely green. Put green in there. And that's the color. And We'll use 0.4 for this. We got, got all of our materials for our different fruits. And we can go through and assign all of these. So for our kiwi, we're going to assign this to the outside. And then outside, oops, outside, inside. Same thing. So we're going to repeat this over and over again. Once again, I'll probably fast forward through this. All right, there we go. So we've got our apple, our kiwi, a lemon, orange, and watermelon. So I can bring these into our scene and get the different variations. Looks great. Now, one other thing I might wanna do is adjust their size a little bit, just to give them a different variation in size. For example, maybe I want our, water, our watermelon to be a lot bigger, so we can maybe do 1.5 for all of this, make that bigger. Um, for our orange, we'll do the orange to be just a tiny bit bigger from our one. So we'll do 1.1. 1. 1. Um, we'll keep the apple kind of at one. So the apple will sort of be our baseline there. Our kiwi will definitely be smaller. So let's do like 0. 0.75 for our kiwi. And then the lemon is maybe just a little bit smaller than the, kind of the apple. So and once again, it's totally preference, so feel free to adjust it. But they, there's a little bit of variation in size. We'll kind of make it a little bit more interesting. The kiwis will be a little bit harder to hit. And then the watermelon will be very easy to hit. Much bigger. All right, so those are all set up. We can delete those from our scene. And we're all good there in terms of our fruit setup. Okay, let's go ahead and create our first script for spawning all of our fruits. Go ahead and create a new folder here for scripts. And I will right click create C sharp script and we're going to name this spawner. Go ahead and open this up. So by default, Unity is going to create a class for us that inherits from mono behavior. By it inheriting from mono behavior, it allows us to actually add this script to a game object in our scene. And there are some placeholder functions that are very commonly used. I actually like to kind of delete everything and just start fresh personally. 
Just my preference. All right, so for our spawner, let's actually go back to our scene real quick. I want to do a couple things. One, let's create a brand new uh, empty object in our scene. I'm going to call this spawner. I'm going to reset the position. And we can now drag our script onto it there. So the location of our spawner is going to dictate where our fruit spawn. So we want to position this in our scene. Um, now, we of course want everything to kind of start below the screen and get projected upwards. So we're going to just change the Y axis here. Let's say maybe negative 15 to kind of push it way below and then we'll launch things upwards. Now, another thing I want to do is allow things to spawn you know maybe to the left or to the right there's a few different ways we could that we could do this we could just identify specific spawn points um, but what i like to often do is have some kind of collider that's a trigger so there's nothing is actually going to physically collide with this we're just going to use the collider for its bounds if you're if you have your gizmos turned on you can see the green outline for the bounds and we can let the bounds of this kind of represent where our objects can spawn. So in this case, for example, we'll pick a random, any random point within this bounds of our collider, and that's where we'll spawn our objects. Um, so I'm gonna just maybe set the size here to like 10. So there's some variation in it spawning to the left or the right. Um, and maybe even the Z axis, I can make it a little bit, um, a little bit deeper that way there's a little bit more depth between um, different fruits spawning. I'm um, able to set this to two, just a little bit. And the Y doesn't really matter too much. Even We even could just set it to zero, so it's sort of a flat plane at that point, but we can keep it. So this collider, once again, will represent the area we'll spawn things in, and we want it to be a trigger so nothing actually collides with it. All right, so let's go back to our script. And we need to get a reference to that collider so we can then get the bounds and pick a random position. Let's create a variable for collider. And we'll just call this our spawn area. And we can assign this in our awake function, which is a function that Unity calls automatically when the script is initialized. And for any built-in Unity function like this, the casing needs to be identical. It needs to be a capital A, not a lowercase a, or it won't get called. That goes for all of Unity's built-in functions. Okay, so in here we can say spawn area equals get component. This is another built-in function Unity provides. What it's going to do is it's going to look on the same object that our script is running on. It allows us to get a component on that same object. So in this case, we're getting a reference to this collider. We can say get collider, get collider, or get component, and then we can specify the type of component we want to get, which will be a collider there. Use the angle brackets and specify the type, and there we go. Now, when we actually do the spawning, it's going to kind of loop and repeat over and over again. So we're going to handle that in a coroutine, um, which I'll explain in a little bit more depth, but let's just get it set up initially, and then I'll explain how it works once we start implementing it. We're going to start our coroutine on enable. This is another built-in Unity function that gets called when our script is enabled. And our script is enabled anytime this checkbox, or well, it doesn't show up yet, but let me save here. And now that that's there, you'll see there will, there will be a checkbox. So this checkbox is representing whether the behavior is enabled or not. So when it gets enabled, we can do something. And then similarly, when we, uh, we disable it, we can also handle some stuff here. We're gonna start their coroutine on enable and we're gonna stop it on, on disable. Stopping it's actually really simple. It's just stop all grow routines. And then on enable, we can say start coroutine. Now we need to pass in the function that we're going to call, um, the actual routine function that's going to get called. So we need to create that function. So let's go ahead and create another function. It actually needs to have a return type of I enumerator, um, which comes from using system.collections. So we need to import system.collections in order to get this this type here. And we're gonna just maybe call this function spawn. This is the actual routine that's gonna contain all the logic and it's gonna just kind of um, repeat this over and over again. We're gonna actually call this function in there. So we're starting this spawn routine. And then on disable, when our spawner gets disabled, we stop it. So that's the basic structure. 
Well, we're gonna set up all of our logic in there and I'll further explain how coroutines work. Um, but we need a bunch of variables that we can customize. We're gonna have a bunch of public variables. By them being public, they're gonna actually show up in the editor so we can just freely customize them as we want. So for one, we need an array of prefabs that we can randomly pick to spawn, right? So our array of fruits. We can define an array here of game objects and I'm just gonna call these fruit prefabs. We can also have some variables for the kind of delay between spawning a fruit. Um, and this can be a range. So we can have a min spawn delay and a max spawn delay. So maybe for example, we want to wait at least a quarter of a second to one second between different fruits spawning. And obviously you can customize these. These are just the defaults. We will be able to change them in the editor. So we can just tweak them as we want. These just serve as the defaults. Uh, we might want to have some variables for the angle in which a fruit spawns. That way there's some variation in terms of it kind of getting launched diagonally or straight up. We can maybe have a min angle of let's say negative 15 and a max angle of maybe positive 15. And then we should also have some variables for min force and a max force. So this is how, how much essentially strength is there when we launch it up in the air and i've tested some values and with my exact setup um i i found that between 18 and 22 works pretty well but you may need to customize this based on your particular game um and then let's have one last variable here for the maximum amount of time a fruit can sort of be alive um that way we are despawning the objects um once they're you know no longer relevant so we can just have like a max lifetime, maybe a five seconds. So a, spoo a, a fruit will spawn and then it will be alive for at most five seconds before it'll just get despawned. And that should be enough time that the fruit object will either have been sliced or um, it's already fallen off the screen. And at which point we can delete it without anyone even noticing. We just wanna clean up those resources so they don't stick around forever. Um, let me show you here in our um, oh, so it doesn't show the variables yet because I have an error. But let me um, comment this out just for a second so I can show you what it looks like when we um, have all those variables. So you can see now, it, now it's compiled successfully without there being any errors. All of those variables showed up and we can freely customize these if we need to. Um, in fact, while we're here, why don't we assign our prefabs? So we can change the array size to 5 we can drag in all of our different prefabs. And we don't need the fruit base, um, just the actual fruits here, apple, kiwi, lemon, orange, watermelon. Feel free to change this. If you have more or less, you know, you can add those in and we're good there. Cool. Oh, this is super random, kind of off topic, but I just noticed our scene is still called sample scene. So I'm just gonna simply rename this to, I don't know, Fruit Ninja. Doesn't really matter, but okay. Anyways, off topic, let's get back to our spawner here. Let's actually implement our um, logic for spawning. Let's add that back in. So a coroutine, what it does, it'll, it allows us to yield the execution, or kind of pause the execution of this function and wait for something to happen before we continue again. In our case, we're just gonna wait a set amount of time before then we sort of loop over again and start, start a new spawn. So we can say while the behavior is enabled, we're going to kind of continuously do something over and over again. So this is a while loop. It's going to repeat this logic over and over again. Um, and it's going to repeat it for, or after we do some logic here, we're going to then yield, we'll say yield return new wait for seconds. So we're just going to wait X amount of seconds before we then start the loop over again. And this will just be a random value. So we can use Unity's random um, class. They have a random.range function. And we can specify our min spawn delay and then our max spawn delay. So it's going to wait a random amount of time between these two values before it then starts our loop over again. We also might want to have an initial delay when the spawner first is enabled. Maybe we should have an initial delay so it doesn't happen immediately that way when you're maybe transitioning between a game over and starting a new game there's at least a couple seconds before it starts spawning things so we can yield and kind of do the same thing here at the very beginning 
yield return new wait for seconds i'm just gonna hard code a value in here let's say two seconds so there'll be a two second delay before it actually starts spawning things all right in our while loop let's actually do all the logic for um for spawning a fruit so one we need to pick a random fruit from our array we can say fruit prefabs and we can access our array at some random index so we can say random.range again and we can pick a index index is always between zero and then however um, big our array is we can say fruit prefabs.length that's going to get a random index um, based on the size of our array that'll be the fruit we spawn we also need to position the spawn our fruit at create a new vector three here and we'll assign each axis individually to just be a random value based on our spawn area. So that collider we added, this is where this will come into play. So every collider has a balance property. And we can say balance.min.x and then balance.max.x. So once again, we're picking a random value between min x, max x. We're gonna do the same thing for each axis. So we'll do x, y, and z. All will just be a random, points within the bounds of that collider we defined for our rotation this will be where our angle comes into play so we're going to get a random kind of rotation here now rotations are expressed as quaternions which are sort of a more complicated math subject that i'm not going to get into um, but we can also just create a rotation using normal euler angles which is a lot easier and when you're looking at an object in the editor this rotation are just euler angles um, so in our case we want to change the z axis here it kind of gets tilted a little bit that way it'll get launched in um, you know a diagonal or so we're going to always launch based on this green arrow so that's the up direction um, but you can see if we even though the up is really the y axis when we rotate on the z it's really affecting um, you can see the blue is our Z. The, the Z actually stays still. When, when you rotate on an axis, that axis actually stays exactly still and the other two axes get affected. If we rotate on our Z, that's going to change our up direction, which will allow us to launch our fruit at different angles. So let's go back. And we're going to say Euler here. So we don't need X, we don't need Y, we just need to set our Z. This is just, once again, going to be a random value between our min angle and max angle. Just kind of using random not range all over the place. And then now we can actually spawn our fruit. So we can say instantiate. We can pass in that object we are going to clone. So we're picking a prefab and it's going to make a copy of this object. We can pass in our position and our rotation. Now this will return the new object. So let's actually get that here. Um, and maybe, maybe I'll do this. I'll call this prefab. I'm gonna change that. I'm gonna call that prefab and I'm gonna call this fruit. So the actual object that gets instantiated, I'm calling fruit. The thing we pick will just be the prefab. Um, and we're good there. Now we have this max lifetime. So we wanna destroy the fruit after the max lifetime. So we can say destroy and we can pass in our fruit and we can say max lifetime. So this is another built-in unity function. It's gonna destroy this game object after X amount of seconds, which is specified by this variable here. And finally, we just need to actually launch our fruit up in the air by adding a force to the rigid body component. We need to get a reference to the fruit's rigid body so we can add a force to it. Um, and we can pick a random, let's pick a random value between our min and max here. So let's just call this, let's say force equals random dot range between min force and max force. And then we can say fruit dot get component. So we're gonna get the rigid body component on our fruit. And we're gonna add a force. We're gonna add a force always in the up direction of the fruit. Now, we spawn the fruit at this rotation. So at this point, when we say fruit dot or fruit dot transform dot up, that's going to be pointing based on that rotation. The fruit dot transform dot up is the direction we're going to add our force. We're going to multiply that by our scalar here, our actual force value. And then we want to apply this force as an impulse. Um, so there's different modes you can apply force, impulse, 
so on for some of these other ones they they need to happen every frame it's more of a continuous force being added but in this case where it's just a single force right as it spawns so that's what an impulse is intended for kind of adds it instantly all right so there we go so we are spawning our object random position rotation random prefab we add our initial force and then we yield for x amount of seconds and then it repeats the process all over again let's go ahead and actually test this out Got our spawner we set our collider we set our prefabs everything's good we should be able to just test this let's play our game and see what happens there's our lemon nice they're real and you can see they're kind of coming in at different angles it all looks good now one thing i don't like is the shadows this is something i guess i sort of forgot to do earlier but we can adjust the uh, sort of position and rotation of our light here just to be a little bit nicer because i feel like these shadows are you know i don't really like them i'm gonna just change this um let's change our rotation to let's say 10 and um you know negative five just to make it a little bit more direct so before it was kind of pointed way down here you can see the light there is pointing way down i'm just kind of making it more straight on not exactly straight on just slightly kind of off angle so you get a little bit of shadow and that looks it also kind of brightens up our background a little bit more so that looks good i might want to change the um, intensity of the shadows themselves i can change this to 0.5 to make it a little bit less noticeable so that looks pretty good now, one thing, I just changed these properties while the game is running. When I stop the game, all that's gonna get reset. So I stop and they get reset. So that's one common mistake you might make. Um, so let me just change these. And negative five, and I change the strength to be half. Once again, all preference, feel free to customize that to your liking. But that's it, I've got everything spawning now. Okay, let's go ahead and create our blade so we can start slicing our fruit. Let's go ahead and create a new empty game object in our scene. We'll call this blade. I'm going to reset the position. And for our blade, we need to add a collider to it so we can detect when the blade actually touches or collides with a fruit. And the type of collider used doesn't really matter. I'll just use a sphere collider. We do want it to be a trigger though, because we don't want to actually like physically collide. We just want to know when it triggers, when you enter the same area as a fruit, it's going to trigger and then we'll know to um, slice the fruit. That's good there. We can go ahead and create our script as well. So let's right click C sharp script. I'll call this blade and we'll attach the script to our game object here as well. I'll just drag that up. It does the word doesn't really matter um and let's also tag our blade as player that way when we eventually detect collision with the fruit we'll know that it was the blade that collided with the fruit and not something else it wasn't some other piece of fruit it was specifically the blade so we can use the tag to know which object actually collided with the fruit let's go ahead and start editing our blade script here and per usual i'm going to kind of delete the um default um, kind of boilerplate code Unity provides and let's start fresh here so for our blade we need to check for input um, so checking for input is usually done in the update function which is another built-in unity function that gets called every single frame the game is running make sure this is a capital u not a lowercase and in here we can check for input so we can say if input dot get mouse button down for example and we can specify which mouse button. So, so our left click is actually just zero. And then we can say also get mouse button up. Same thing, left click for zero, zero is left click. So when we press down and when we release, press up. Um, so when we go down, when we press down, we will start slicing. And when we release, we'll stop slicing. Let's add some functions for that. We can start, start slicing. And stop slicing and we'll call those when you mouse down we'll start and when we mouse up we will stop and then we need to have a function for continuing your slice if you're sort of in the middle of um, holding down we'll add a function for continue slicing but we only want to call that if you're actually being if you're actually mouse down 
Um, so it'd be useful to have a variable for a Boolean here just to indicate whether or not we actually are slicing. And we'll set that to true when we start. We'll set it to false when we stop. So if you didn't just start, if you didn't just stop, and we are in the middle of slicing, then we will continue slicing here. And so mouse down, start, mouse up, stop. Otherwise, we will continue so long as that Boolean is set to true. And then if it's not set to true, then we just do nothing. Now for these functions, we need to, one, we need to turn on and off the collider on our blade. If the collider is turned off, then you won't actually be able to slice the fruit because it won't detect that collision. So we need to get a reference to our collider and turn on and off. Let's get a private reference here to our collider. I'll just call this the blade uh, collider. We can assign this in our awake function. Per, um, per usual, this is what we've done in some of our other code already. Get component, collider, same code we did in our spawner. So for our black cl blade collider, we will enable it when we start slicing and we will disable it when we stop slicing. Perfect. And then when we continue slicing, we just need to update the position of our blade based on your mouse position. And by the way, these mouse positions, I do, I do believe they translate to mobile um, automatically. They should be good there. All right, so for continue, we need to update the position of our blade based on your mouse position or your touch position. Um, now our mouse position is in screen space. Um, we need to convert that to world space because our blade is in world space, our mouse is not. So we need to make a conversion there. To make that conversion, we, we have to use a function that's available on your camera. Um, so let's get a reference to the camera and we'll make this private as well because we can actually, um, oh, let me call this like, I'll just call this main camera. Um, we can assign this here as well um, because there's camera.main. So we'll, any camera in your scene that is tagged as main camera, which is a built-in tag, um, it will get assigned to this property here for camera.main. And so when we continue, we can convert now from screen space to world space. So let's get a vector for our new blade position here. And we'll say main camera dot screen to world point. So this is making that conversion from screen space to world space. And the position, the screen space position we're gonna provide is our input dot mouse position. Oops, input dot mouse position. That's making the conversion. Now our mouse position is 2D essentially a 2D vector, whereas world space, everything's in 3D. So the Z axis, when we do this conversion, the Z axis is just going to get projected out into the world, which doesn't help us because then our blade's not going to be on the same kind of plane as the rest of our fruit. So we're just going to reset the Z to zero. We're just going to say new position dot Z equals zero because we're going to spawn all the fruit at a depth of zero. It's like, even though it's a 3D game, it sort of plays more like a 2D game. So we're kind of just ignore, ignoring the Z axis for the most part. We're gonna kind of just set our blade to be at, at the origin, because that's kind of where we're, we spawn all our fruit at too. Now we need to know what direction the blade is moving in. And to get a direction, you can subtract two points. If you subtract two points, it, it results in a direction from one point to the other. So we have our new position and we have our current position, which is whatever our transform is. All right, so we can get the direction by subtracting those two things. And we should actually store this in a variable because we're going to need to use it in our fruit for our fruit later on. Um, so, and this also needs to be public because we need to be able to access it from our fruit script later on. So we're gonna make this public what direction but I don't need it to be publicly settable. I only need to be able to read it from other scripts. I need to be able to read it from external scripts, but not set it. It only gets set here. So I can have a public getter with a private setter. That way only this class can actually change the value, but other classes can read it if they need to. 
for our direction, like I said, we can subtract two points. So we can say new position minus our current position, which is just the position of the transform of our blade. That gives us the direction the blade is moving in. And from that direction, we can actually determine how fast it's moving, what the velocity of it is. So let's say velocity equals, it's gonna be the magnitude of our vector. So that's like how long, what's the length of that vector? Essentially, what's the distance between these two points? Divided by time, um, specifically how much time has elapsed since the previous frame, right? So however, how much has it moved over the past frame that tells us how fast it's moving. Velocity is basically distance divided by time. And the reason we want to get velocity here is because we want to disable our um, our blade collider if uh, if it's not moving at all. Basically, if our velocity isn't above some threshold, then we should disable our collider because at that point you're not really you're not really slicing. You're just kind of holding your mouse down but not moving. So you're not really slicing. So we can say our um, blade collider is enabled only if your velocity is greater than some threshold. And we can even have a variable for this if we want. We can have a public float. We'll call this like min, uh, min slice velocity, for example. And this should be a pretty small number. Uh, let's say 0. Um, 0 0.01. But you can play around with this. We're making it public and we can then change it in the editor. But if our velocity is greater than the minimum slice velocity, then our collider is enabled. Otherwise, it'll get disabled. So that's all good. And then from here, we just need to update our blade um, position to be the new position. And we want to do this last because we need to use the current position to get the direction and velocity and stuff. We, we need to update this as the very last thing we do. Now, when we first start slicing, we should also basically set this position. Um, so when we first start slicing, we should say, um, you know, transform that position. Or we'll, we'll basically just copy this code here. We'll get the position and we'll set our, um, we'll set our new position here or our initial position. So as soon as you click down, we're gonna move the blade to where you click down at that mouse position and then we'll enable slicing and it'll continue on from there. All right, so that should be good. Um, the only other thing we probably want to do is stop slicing when the blade becomes disabled. So kind of similar to what we did in our spawner where we stopped the coroutine on disable. We kind of want to do the same thing when we, um, when we disable our blade, we will stop slicing. So we can just call our stop slicing function. And we actually should probably call that when we enable too. Because at the point that you're first enabling the blade behavior, you're not doing anything yet. You haven't like, then once it's enabled, update will be called. Update is only called if your behavior is enabled. Then we'll check for input and you know, it'll start or stop or continue as needed. But when you first enable, you're not doing anything yet. So just in case, just to make sure everything's reset back to the kind of off state, we will stop both when we enable and disable. All right, let's go ahead and test this out. That's gonna be, there's nothing to really visualize. So just for temporarily, I'm just gonna add a blank sphere to our um, to our blade here. I'm gonna delete that in a minute, but just so we can actually see this moving. Yeah, so there, when I'm not holding down my mouse, nothing happens. I hold down and now I can, you know, it basically tracks the position. And then that's where we can then look for collision between our blade here and the other things. And this is where it's important that our, our blade is a trigger because otherwise we would not be able to sort of pass through these objects like we are right now. And notice how it's off. I click down, but I'm not moving. So it's still off. And then as soon as I start moving, it turns on. And then if I stop, it turns off and so on. If I'm constantly moving, then it stays on, but otherwise it goes off. So that's all working good. We can delete the sphere. That was just to help visualize it. So we're good there. Now, what we can do is add a trail renderer to our blade to kind of 
create a better, we can sort of sell that motion a lot better and give it a, a more interesting visual appeal. So we can right click our blade here and let's add a effect. We do effects and we'll do trail. It's gonna create a trail renderer. And this is, a lot of this is just gonna kind of be your preference in terms of how you want it to look. Um, but I'll do a pretty simple trail renderer here. Um, if we move our blade, you can sort of see it. Obviously that does not look very good and it stays way too long. So first thing we wanna change is the time. This is how long does the tail last? So five seconds is way too long. We want this to be very short, like 0.2 seconds. That way it'll kind of disappear right away. Well, so that looks better. Let me reset this to zero. Um, now for the end of the trail, I want it to be rounded. So I can set the end cap vertices to four. That'll make it a little bit more rounded, which is gonna look a little bit better. Um, lighting, we don't need lighting or shadows or any of that, so we can turn all that off. We can keep the material just kind of at the default, but this width is what I want to change. So it's way too big right now, as you can sort of see. Oh yeah, and now you can see how it's sort of rounded at the ends. So that looks good. The width is way too much. I'm going to reduce this to like 0.4, for example. And I also want it to sort of get smaller as it trails off. So at the at the head of it, it'll be this full width, but then at the very end, it'll be zero. So we can add another keyframe in here by double clicking, or I think you can also right click and add a keyframe. You can right click this now and edit it. We're gonna set the time to be one and the value to be zero. So at time time of one is saying at the very end of the trail, at the end of the, you know, the, you know just at the end of the trail, it's gonna have a value of zero or a width of zero. And then this is a little curve, that's fine. However you wanna kind of curve it, it doesn't matter. If you want it to be linear, you can change these to be auto. And then it'll just be sort of a linear, you know, interpolation from start to end. Now, if we move this around, yeah, that looks way better. So you can kind of get that nice slicing motion. So that looks good. Let's go ahead and run this and there you go. So now we can see that. Now there's sort of a couple bugs in a sense, which is that when I move my, like let go and I move my mouse to a new position, it's gonna create a line across the screen like that, which is, I kind of see that as a bug. So we can fix that by clearing our trail whenever we start slicing. So we need to get a reference to our trails. Let's go ahead and trail renderer here. I'm gonna call this the blade trail. Um, and let's go ahead and get this. Now this one, we can't get component because it's a child. It's get component looks on the same exact object. This is technically a different object because it's a child, but there's a function called get component in children. And here we can look for our trail renderer. So for our, uh, blade trail here, we want to, um, well, one, we should also enable and disable it when we start and stop. So we can enable this sort of the same way and disable it as well. And then the only other thing we wanna do is we wanna clear it. So when we enable it, we'll also clear. So we'll say blade trail dot clear. It's just a function that will clear all of the points from the renderer. Now, one thing that's important is that us updating the position, the initial position when we start slicing, this needs to happen first before we clear. Otherwise, it'll still do that bug. Um, so just one thing to note there. Let's go ahead and test this out, see if it works. Yeah, so now if I click across the screen, even if I just click and it's by itself, nothing happens because I have to really start moving. So that looks better. It feels, feels a lot better. There you go. So that's our blade trail. Looks great. All right, let's go ahead and add in our fruit script so we can actually handle slicing now that we've got our blade working. Go ahead and create a new script for our fruit. And we can assign this script to our base prefab here. And since, we adding, since we're adding it to our base, it's going to automatically apply to all of our other prefabs since these prefabs are variants of the base. That's why it's really important that these are all variants. That way, if we make any changes to the base, it'll affect everything. So we can see here, the fruit script is now on all of our fruit, which is perfect. Um, let's go ahead and hit this. And per usual, I'm going to delete the boilerplate here. 
So for our fruit, the main thing we need to do is turn off. Um, let's actually take a look at our um, object real quick. So we need to turn off this hole and turn on the sliced. We need to get a reference to those two game objects so we can swap them. Um, so let's go ahead and open this up and let's add some public references here. Public reference to our game object for a hole and same thing for the sliced. And we can, we'll assign those in the editor, but let's go ahead and keep writing the script. We're also going to need a reference to our, the rigid body and the collider of our fruit as a whole. Um, so I'm going to call this, uh, we'll call this fruit rigid body and we'll call this fruit collider. So for the collider, we're going to turn off the collider once it gets sliced. That way you can't slice it again. You can only slice it once. And for the rigid body, we want, we need this rigid body because the individual halves of the sliced game object here, they have their own rigid bodies, but because this game object is disabled it, when we enable it, it's going to, those rigid bodies aren't going to have any, you know, velocity. So we want to transfer the velocity from the fruit as a whole to each individual slice. That way they kind of maintain the same, you know, uh, trajectory. Let's check for collision with our blade. So Unity has some built-in functions like on trigger enter, on trigger exits, um, and then they have on collision enter, on collision exit. So if something's marked as trigger, you'll get trigger enter. If it's not a trigger, then you'll get on collision enter. But in our case, our blade is a trigger. So on trigger enter, and here you get the other collider that you collided with. And we need to check that this other collider is the blade because it could be something else. It might not be the blade. It could be another fruit or so on. So here we can say if other compare tag is the player. You remember from earlier, we tagged our blade as the player. We go to our blade here. Make sure you set the tag to be player. Would player is one of the built-in tags. We could add a custom one that's called like blade or something, but it doesn't really matter. So long as that tag matches what we're doing here in our code, then we're good. Make sure it's the same casing and everything. So at this point, we know we've collided with the blade and we can maybe call a function, our slice function. We'll call slice. Now in slicing, we actually wanna pass in a few parameters here. One is the direction that you sliced the fruit in. That way we can apply a force to the fruit in that direction to kind of push it in that direction. And we'll use this direction to calculate the angle that we need to rotate the fruit so it gets sliced at the right, you know, based on the direction you're slicing it, the fruit will, you know, get rotated to match that. We also want a position here, the position that sort of you came in contact with the fruit. Because um, then we can add a force at that position to, you know, further push the fruit um, in that direction and finally we can have a float here for just how much force do we want to add to the fruit when you slice it and so all of these parameters are going to come from the blade itself especially in direction if you remember earlier we added this public variable for direction or it's a public getter because we want to be able to read this value and pass it in here but to do that we need to get a reference to our blade script on this other object that we collided with we know from checking that it's the player the blade so now we can sort of safely get the blade component we can say blade equals other uh, get component and we're going to look for our blade script on it and so then we can pass in our blade direction since that is a public variable we added the position will just be the position of the blade. It's sort of the contact point that um, you, it, the blade made with the fruit. And then the force, we actually don't have this. Why don't we go ahead and add another variable to our, to our blade here for uh, slice force. And we'll maybe set this to five. I'll show you what that does once we actually can test this out. We'll say blade.slice force. All right, so in terms of actually slicing our fruit, we need to disable our whole game object here. And it's actually not disable, enabled properties used for behaviors. This is not a behavior, it's a whole game object. 
And for game objects, you set them to be active or not active, which is going to make all of the components disabled and any children and so on. So we'll set active to be false for the whole, but for sliced, we'll set it to be true. Now we also want to disable the collider on our fruit as a whole because we don't want to check for collision again once you've already sliced um, this fruit. So that's good. What else do we need to do? We need to calculate the angle um, based on this direction so we can rotate the fruit to match. Let's go ahead and do that. Um, we can just use a little bit of simple trigonometry here. So Unity has some built-in functions in their MathF class. So MathF.a tan2, we're gonna get the tangent or yx here. So direction y and direction f. That's gonna give us the angle that we can rotate our fruit in. Now this returns an angle in radians. When we set the rotation, we it needs to be in degrees. So we can convert this to degrees by saying mathf rad two degrees radians two degrees this is just a constant value that you multiply by to get to two to degrees and then just like we've done for some other other things like when we spawned our fruit we set the rotation and we only changed the z-axis here same thing we can um, set the sliced fruit um, transform rotation to be quaternion Euler, zero for the X, zero for the Y. We only need to set the angle on the Z axis. And that's gonna rotate our sliced fruit to match the direction that we actually sliced it at. And now from here, we can add a force to each of the individual slices. Um, now this is sort of the parent object for the slice. Now there's two children of that, which are each half of it. And we want to get the reference to the rigid bodies of each of those halves so we can add a force to it and set the velocity to, to kind of match the velocity of the fruit as a whole. Um, so one, let's get um, an array of rigid bodies. We'll call these slices. We can say slice.get component in children and we'll look for a rigid body here. So we're going we're gonna to get those rigid bodies that we added to each of the individual um, slices now i'm getting error here because i made a typo this should be plural get components because there's more than one so it's plural which is going to return an array here we can loop through this array using a for each for each that's basically slice in slices we can now do something so first we want to set the velocity to match whatever the velocity of our fruit was that way it maintains the same trajectory that our fruit was already moving in we're just going to set the same velocity. But then we can also add a custom force, add force, and we're going to add a force at a position. So we're going to add a force at the contact, the point of collision. That way it sort of, it'll, it'll one, it'll cause rotation of the fruit. It'll also cause it to kind of get pushed in one direction. So the force here is going to be the direction that we sliced it at times that force um, multiplier that we, we had from our blade. And then the position is the position parameter that we passed in, which once again is just the position of the blade. So we're adding a force at the position of the blade and the, the direction the blade is moving by this blade's slice force, whatever that value is. And finally, we should add this force as an impulse because it's a one-time force being added. It's not something we're doing continuously over time, so it needs to be an impulse. And that is good. I think that's all we need to do. At least for now. Let's go ahead and actually test this out. And let's make sure we set. So on our blade, we've got that slice force is set to five by default. Let's go to our fruit here. Yeah, we need to set these. So whole and sliced. So let's assign those whole and sliced. And once again, I'm changing the base prefab, which will change all of them. So you can see automatically that I got set. And let's go ahead and just test this out. So, oh, I saw one, I got an error. So I got a null reference exception, which usually means I forgot to assign something. Um, well, let's see. We got our stack trace here. It's happening on line 16 of our fruit script. Open that up. Oh, yeah. I forgot to assign our rigid body and collider. So 
So this is a very common error, null reference exception. It means you're trying to access some reference that isn't hasn't been assigned. It's null. There's no value to it. So if, as soon as you try to access something, it'll break. We need to actually assign those references in our awake function, just like we've done in other code. So fruit rigid body equals get component rigid body and fruit collider get component collider. Now we should be good. Test this again. All right, so let's slice this, slice, slice. So notice if I go straight down, it, you know, the, you can see this. Oops, I didn't mean to zoom in like that. If I go straight down, it kind of is just up and down. If I go left and right, it's left and right. So it's going to actually rotate. It's rotating the fruit at that direction that I'm moving. So it actually really feels like I'm perfectly slicing it. Now, there's some instances I'm noticing where it feels like I'm slicing it, but it's not actually slicing it. And that might just be because the collider on my blade is pretty small. I might want to make this a little bit bigger. Um, our blade, and I should probably set this to zero. The Z axis is at zero, which is where we spawn all of our fruit. Although the, um, the spawn area here represented by our collider it does have a z axis a, a z size of two so they can kind of be a little bit up or a little bit forward or back so we want to make sure our blade is big enough to cover that whole range so just increase the size to one instead of 0.5 and that should work a little bit better yeah so we can slice great and so now notice let's do one other thing let's change this slice force just to illustrate this i'm going to change it to 25. Notice when I slice in the, to the left, the, they get pushed to the left. I slice, you know, up, it's going to get pushed up. It's going to push it in the, whatever direction I'm slicing in. And then based on this force here, 25 is a little extreme to me. I just want it to be a fairly subtle. So this feels great. Now notice how the slices actually collide with each other because for each of the slices, we actually, they're not triggers. They actually will physically collide with each other, which in my opinion, makes it more interesting. So yeah, this all looks great. This is good. One thing we can do to make our fruit slicing feel even better is to add a particle effect whenever you slice it and maybe some juice squirting out from the fruit. Let's go ahead and open up our fruit base prefab and let's add a particle effect to this. So we can right click our base here and go to effects particle system. I'm just going to rename to this to be juice. You can call it whatever. It doesn't really matter. And there's so many properties on here that sometimes it can be a little bit daunting, um, but I've already worked through some properties that feel pretty good to me. Um, so let's start working through these. So for one, let's set the duration of V1. And actually, let's go to our scene view so we can preview this. So there's our particles. It's just not at all what we want, but we're going to get there. It doesn't need to loop because it's just a single kind of burst of, of particles. So it doesn't need to loop. Max duration of one. The start lifetime needs to be way less. And we can make it kind of random between two values. So maybe particles last between 0.3 and 0.5 seconds. It's pretty quick. It's a quick little burst the speed maybe between 5 and 10 so some will be faster than others um, same thing for the size maybe be between 0.4 and 0.6 like make them a little bit smaller overall uh, we do want to add our gravity modifier so we're going to set that to one this is acts as like a multiplier so in your project settings in the physics there's a gravity multiple uh, you're just your gravity settings so negative 9.81 times this modifier so times one which would just be negative 9.81 it's kind of hard to tell but they start to fall down a little bit um it's it's hard to tell just because they're so quick but that is good you can customize that if you want um Let's see, max particles. We don't need a thousand particles. I think 25 at the max is all we really need, but feel free to adjust that. Um, and the important thing here that we want to change is this rate over time. So we don't want to emit the particles over time. We want just a single burst. So they actually have a burst thing here. So let's add one, let's click the plus sign. It's going to start at zero. It's going to start immediately. Let's say we burst between um, 15 and 25. There's only one cycle 
um yeah the interval and all probability none of that matters 100 percent probability of this happening at the very beginning of the um particle effect burst between 15 and 25. So there we can see now you can kind of see that burst the other thing here is the shape so one there's all getting pushed out in this cone shape which is not what we want we want to change this to be a sphere so it can kind of go in any direction so that's starting to feel a lot better already um i want to change the thickness though to zero um because otherwise some particles with one that can spawn anywhere from the very center to the edge whereas with zero they'll always spawn at the edge just to make sure they always kind of burst out from the very edge of the our sphere here that's all for emission shape um the size over lifetime we want to enable this module and we want to make it so they become smaller they're basically going to go from full full size to zero so we can do a curve here and you'll click it once it's red we can drag this up and we want to do sort of the exact opposite of this curve which is we want to go from one to zero so there's i think some built-in presets here that you can use but from starting at one to zero now they sort of yeah they kind of become smaller so that looks good and then finally all we really want to do is change how it gets rendered um i mean this is this works but i think personally it looks a lot better if we change this to a, be a mesh and we're going to emit some spheres as well some little tiny spheres and then what we're going to do is we're going to set the material to be the same material we're, we're going to use for each fruit. So we'll have to set this for each one. Since this is just the base. It doesn't really matter. I'll just set it to be outside. But it's going to use the exact same material that we're rendering for the outside of our um, of our fruit here. And that like that looks pretty good to me. It looks like little little kind of juice squirts. So this is good. I think that's all we need. The only thing we want to change is we need to go into each individual um, fruit now and override because they're still using that same material. So we're going to override the material to be whatever that fruit's outside one is. So for apple, it'll be, you know, the apple outside and so on. We'll change that for each of these. So we'll go into each one, change this one to be lemon outside. Creates a kiwi. Um, kiwi. Now you could make it the inside. You can set it to be any material. It doesn't have to be the outside, but I personally just find that that looks best. Even though it technically it doesn't really make sense. It should be like the inside because that's really where the juice is. But I found, I just thought this personally looked a lot better. Okay. And then watermelon here. Let's change this one to be a watermelon. All right, cool. Great. Um, now we need to trigger that particle effect when our thing gets sliced. So initially we're going to have this turned off. Actually, we don't need to turn it off. We'll just disable. There's a play on awake. We're going to uncheck that and we're going to manually tell it when to play. So in our fruit script, let's get a reference to that. Um, this will be a particle system and we'll call this our juice, um, particle we'll just call it juice yeah we'll say juice particle effect and let's assign this now we need to get component in children here because it's a child um, particle system and we'll play this um, you know we can just play this after we when we slice it let's go ahead and test that out once again, I changed the material for each one individually, so they all should sort of look a little bit different. Yeah, there we go. Nice. That feels really nice. Now when I slice the fruit, there's, you know, a nice little particle effect to kind of sell it a little bit better. It feels feels really nice. It looks cool, too. So, I mean, feel free to customize the look of that however you want, but there's a ton of properties you can change. You might just need to play around with the different particle system properties. Um, to get it to look the way, look and feel the way you want. This this feels great to me. I like I like it a lot. All right, next up, let's create our scoring and some UI to display that score. Let's right click in our hard key. Let's create a UI text component. Now, if you don't have this UI menu, you probably need to install the Unity UI package. So, in the package manager, which you can access from Window Package Manager. 
check to see that you have the Unity UI installed. Or if you're using other, a different UI library like Text Mesh, Text Mesh Pro, that's fine too. Uh, but I'll be just be using the basic Unity UI. If it's not installed in your project, you can switch this to the Unity registry where you can just install any package and there should be an install button in the bottom right corner. But yeah, I already have that installed. I thought it comes pre-installed in every project, but maybe not. So just check that you have that installed and then you can be able to, you can create your UI components. So here we've got our text component. Um, it also creates a canvas. You have to have a UI canvas to display this on. This has, you know, things like, does it display in, uh, does it get rendered in screen space, world space, so on, where just do screen space overlay. Um, I will change the, the scaler here. So usually I want to do scale with screen size. That way it's going to adjust the size based on the, um, you know, the device, um, the screen resolution of whatever device you're playing on. So usually the reference resolution just depends on what kind of what you're designing your game for. Um, you know, sometimes a lot of times I just do 1920 by 1080 if I'm making a, a desktop game. And then I might have it match like in somewhere try to match the size in between i just do 0.5 but it doesn't really matter too much um cool so for our text component it's really hard to see you can sort of see it right there but let's set this at zero let's adjust some properties here well let's change the color to be let's just do white for now uh, i'll just put like one two three four um let's make this way bigger let's make this like 80. Maybe those two. Oh, so what i usually do is set these to overflow that way i don't really have to worry about the size too much at least for this kind of stuff, it doesn't matter. For other UI things, it might matter. But in this case, I just let it overflow so it can exceed the bound, the bounds of that um, of that text box. Now we actually, I'm gonna have mine anchored to the top left corner, so we can change here. We'll anchor it to the top left. Now we set this to zero into zero, and you can see it up there. But we need to adjust the pivot point because the pivot point's in the center. So we want to set the pivot point to zero and then set the X back to zero. That looks good. You can maybe adjust it a little bit more. Maybe just kind of offset it a little bit. Um, I don't know, negative 20, positive 20. That looks pretty good. It doesn't really matter too much. Uh, cool. Okay, that's good enough. It doesn't really matter. You know, kind of be quick. Um, I'm gonna change the color actually to be like a gold color. Um, what should we do? Let's see what I use here. And we'll do actually works pretty well yeah we'll keep it at that kind of a goldish color maybe i give it a shadow so it is a little bit more visible kind of a little bit of a drop shadow I'll increase the size of the drop shadow a little bit more make it a little bit more legible and at the very beginning we imported a font so i can switch to that font here Helvetica looks a little bit better maybe just the positioning yeah so we got our little kind of text up there in the corner now it looks good um Set the default text to just be zero. Great, so we've got our text up there. Obviously feel free to customize the way it looks. Kind of did that pretty quickly. Um, for scoring, let's handle this in a new script. Um, so let's right click C Sharp script. We'll call this our game manager. So kind of manage the overall state of our game. And let's create an empty object in our scene for this. I'll just call this game manager position. Doesn't really matter, but I'm gonna reset that and drag that on. Let's go ahead and edit this. So we need to get a reference to that text component. So I need to import using unity engine.ui. Now, if you're using a different UI library like text mesh pro, I think text mesh pro is TM pro, uh, but I'm using the built in unity UI and we'll call this text and we'll call it score text. So we'll get a reference to that text so we can update it. We might want to have a function for, um, incre let's say, increasing our score. Um, now this should be public because we're going to be calling this from other scripts. We need an actual score variable, so let's have an integer for what your current score is. And when we increase score, we can increment that by one, and then we can update our text. Score text at text equals score to string. Nice and simple there. Now, when we slice a fruit, we can increase that. So when we slice a fruit, the first thing we'll do is find a reference to our game manager in our entire scene, and we'll say increase score. 
Remember, this has to be public, otherwise you won't be able to call this function from this script. Increase the score. Um, let's add some simple functions for starting a new game. Um, so we'll have a new game function where your score will get reset to zero. And then we will update our score text again. Um, and we need to call new game when this first starts. So Unity has a built-in function called start, in which case we will call new game, which will reset our score. And then we can always call, recall new game at some point um, later on as well. I think that's at least it for now in terms of basic score UI. Let's test it out and just see that. Oh, I need to assign my thing here. Otherwise, yep, I'll get a reference exception. Yeah, let's go ahead and assign this in there. So we got our score text. Probably should call this score text. It's a little bit more descriptive, but it doesn't actually matter. All right, let's see that this works. We should see this number update every time I slice, in which case, yep, there it goes. It gets updated every time. So very simple, just basic, very basic UI, but it gets the job done for our purposes. Now, if you really want to, you can even have your fruits be worth a different amount of points. So for example, if you really wanted to, you could have a, a variable here on your fruit to say how many points is this worth? And maybe by default is worth one point. And so instead of just saying increase score, we can have um, a, a parameter here to say by how much, by an amount. Now we'll say score plus equals an amount and we'll pass in however many points that our fruit is worth. So now if you wanted to, now, by default, they're all worth one, but you could change that per fruit. You could change this number per fruit if you really wanted to. Um, but for now, I'm just going to kind of keep it at a default of one. All right, the very last thing we need to do is add some kind of game over state. And we can add a bomb to our scene. So if you slice the bomb, you lose. Um, now, I don't have a specific model for a bomb, but we can sort of create one ourselves just directly here in the editor. So I'm going to show you how to do that. Let's first, let's create an empty object and I'm gonna call this bomb. We'll position it at the origin. And as a child of this, we can add a sphere kind of as like the base of our bomb. Um, maybe we'll make this a little bit bigger or no, we'll keep it at, we'll just keep it at one. Let's delete the collider because we're gonna add different physics components to the parent here. For now, we're just gonna kind of get the model itself. Have a sphere. We can also add a cylinder as another child. Get rid of the collider on that. It's definitely reduced the size of this to be way smaller. That looks good. And let's position it up a little bit. Uh, let's just say like, well, let's do like one five. That looks pretty good. And then we'll get another cylinder. It'll be even smaller. Let's cut, let's do like really small. Um, actually we'll go even smaller. This will sort of be like your wick in a sense. We'll push and push this up Let's do, I don't know. It looks pretty good. So kind of got just like a very basic bomb. Um, let's go ahead and add in some materials for this. So we can have a material for our bomb and for our bomb wick. And this will just sort of be a black material. And drag that onto that and we'll drag it onto this. And then for our wick here, I'll just make the wick like a red, sort of like a deep, kind of a dark, dark reddish color. Um, we'll get rid of smoothness. We can keep some smoothness on the bomb itself. Maybe do 0.4. There you go. We kind of just threw together a very, you know, basic little bomb. Um, cool. Make sure we delete the colliders on all of those respective objects. Because now we're going to add a collider to the bomb as a whole. So here we're going to add a rigid body. Really, these should be the same sort of um, components as our fruit. In a sense, the bomb is going to act just like a fruit, but you know, obviously it's not a fruit. But rigid body, we'll add a sphere collider, should be marked as a trigger, just the same as the fruit, and so on. So this looks good. Yeah, all that looks good. And now we can create a prefab for this. We'll drag this in our prefabs folder. We got our bomb in there. And let's go ahead and update our spawner script. So there's a chance of spawning a bomb rather than a um, rather than a fruit. 
So let's get a reference to our bomb prefab as well. Now we could just add the bomb to our existing array and not have to change any code. But then there's going to be an equal chance of spawning a bomb along with every other fruit. And I don't think that works very well. I think the bomb should have a very small chance of spawning. That way it's a little bit unexpected and there's not so many of them. So we're going to kind of just treat this as its own thing. So we'll have a reference to the prefab there. And let's have a float here for like the sort of bomb chance. And this will be a really small value, like five. So there's like a 5%, 0 0.05, I should say. There's a 5% chance that a bomb will spawn instead of a fruit. Here, we can say if random.value, this just gets a random value between zero and one. If that is less than our bomb chance, then we're gonna change this prefab to be our bomb prefab. And then the rest of the code still stays the same. We'll still pick a random position, rotation, so on, instantiate it, and but instead we're instantiating the bomb rather than a fruit all right and now let's add a new script for the bomb itself because we're going to handle the collision a little bit differently so let's add a script for this and let's add this script to our bomb now i i added this script to the prefab that exists in our scene but this is just an instance of the actual asset I need what I need to do is really add it to the prefab here. I should have deleted it from our scene and added it here. But just to illustrate, if you do ever do that, notice how it shows blue because it's like a new thing and there's a little plus sign. I can actually right click this and say apply to prefab to actually actually apply it to the asset itself. But otherwise, really, I should have deleted that from the scene and just added it directly to the asset itself. But anyways, we got our bomb script on there. We're good there. Let's go to our spawner and make sure we drag in this prefab there. There's a 5% chance of it spawning. You can obviously tweak that to your to your preference. One thing we probably should do actually um, on the spawner is change this to be a range. So you can add a range attribute here between zero and one because it can only be between zero and one because we're getting a random number between zero and one. But notice now in the editor, this becomes a little slider, which is kind of kind of nice. All right, for our actual bomb script, really, we just need to check for collision in the same way that we did on our fruit. So I can just copy this function down here. Get rid of all that. But instead of slicing, you know, slice a bomb, we can trigger some kind of, you know, game over sequence in a sense. Um, now the game over really that should be handled by our game manager um so we can actually just do the logic itself for for that in our game manager um because when you explode the bomb like there's a number of things that need to happen across the game so really the game manager that's its point is to kind of it can manage the overall state of the game so we're not going to handle the logic here we'll just add we we'll have a function in here maybe called explode once again, it'll be public. That way we can actually call that function. So we don't need this slicing stuff. Then we'll find object of type game manager and we'll call our explode function. And that way we can handle the logic in our game manager. So when we explode, we need to disable the blade, disable the spawner. So we need to get references to those. Let's get a, and these can just be private because we can just search for them in our scene. Um, so let's get a reference to our blade and a reference to our spawner. Um, on awake, we can assign these. So blade, find object to type. We're gonna just look throughout our entire scene for these two objects. We only need to search for them once when the very first time the game starts. And then we're good there. So when we explode, we wanna disable our blade. We want to disable our spawner. And when we disable that script, it won't even check for input or anything. And then because in our spawner, we have it on disable to stop the coroutine. It's going to stop spawning new things. Now, one thing we can do is, well, let's at least test this, this out by itself. Um, let's at least test this out. See that some bombs get spawned and I'll hit one and we'll go from there. Oh, okay, our bomb is really tiny. So that's probably something I want to change. Yeah, so I hit it. My blade went away, nothing's spawning anymore, so we're sort of in a game over state. 
For one, our, our bomb is way too small. So let's bump this up. We're just going to double that in size. Um, change the proof feather. Let me check this. Let's see, see if it looks a little bit better. I actually want them to be kind of large. Yeah, that feels pretty good. I don't really like that material though. I'm going to change the, uh, I'm gonna actually going to maybe just make this say 0.2, just like the other ones. But anyways, that's good. Feel free to customize it how you want. So what we can do is maybe have the screen sort of fade to white um, to kind of indicate like a flash. And then when it fades back, it'll sort of start the game over again. So one way to do this is to actually add like um, an image component to our canvas that we can just kind of fade the color in and out. So we can right click our canvas. We'll go to UI and we'll just add an image. And we don't actually need to provide an image or a sprite for that. By default, it'll just 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 render just whatever the color here. So it'll just be white. We can change this to this bottom right corner. This will scale it to the entire screen. And then we just got to change all this to zero and it'll scale it to be the entire screen size. So now we can just kind of change the L foot. I've kind of faded in and out, right? So we can, we can animate that going in and out. So by default, it'll be at zero because we won't actually see it. Let's turn off Raycast target. That way you can't click this. Or if this is a Raycast target, it's going to prevent us from clicking other things. So we want to definitely turn that off. Same thing for something for our score text. I actually got rid of, or I could just get rid of the graphic raycast on our entire canvas. Um, but if you do for your game, if you have like menus and stuff where you have buttons you need to click on, then you do need this. But for my case, I don't need any kind of graphic raycaster. So I'm not doing any kind of inputs or anything on my UI, but anyways, let's go ahead. Let's call this like, um, uh, fade image. Let's go to reference to that in our game manager. So public image, fade image. And let's go ahead and write the logic for sort of fading this out. To do a custom animation like this, we're gonna use another coroutine. So let's import using system.collections. Let's create our actual routine function here, which needs to return I enumerator. We'll call this our, um, what do we call this? We'll just call this like our explode sequence. Um, so what we want to do is we want to fade out to white. Um, so we need to do this over time. So we need to keep track of how much time has elapsed. We can set a duration for this animation. Let's say it'd be half a second long. So we can make a quick kind of fade to white. So we'll loop while elapsed is less than the duration. We're going to continue to loop over and then we're going to yield every time. And we don't have to wait. We can say re yield return null. It's going to wait to the next frame. It's going to loop over again. So we're going to keep waiting until the next frame until our elapsed, you know, until the elapsed time is finished. So every iteration of our loop, we're going to update time. Elapsed plus equals how much time has passed since the last frame. And from this, we can calculate a percentage um, between, you know, how far along, what's the percentage of the animation being finished? We'll call that T. And that's just, just elapsed divided by duration. And we should clamp this between zero and one just to make sure it doesn't overshoot. So we can say clamp 01, elapsed duration, elapsed divided by duration. So this gives us per percentage between zero and one. And based on that percentage, we can change the um, fade image color. We can lerp or interpolate. Interpolate is just kind of a linear interpolation between two values. So from color.clear, which is a value of an alpha, a zero to color white using T um, as our parameter. So at when T is zero or zero percent, it's going to be clear. And then when T is one or 100%, it's going to be white. And it'll just kind of, you know, as elapsed increases, T increases, and then it gets, goes to white. Now, one thing I could also do is actually slow down time. So as we animate, it's also going to kind of go into slow motion too, which kind of feels nice. I can change the time scale of my game. I can say time that time scale. And this needs to be the inverse, so it needs to be one minus t, because as t approaches one, we actually want the time scale to then be zero. So once t is 100%, it should be zero. So it's the inverse there, one minus t. 
Now, the thing with this is I'm saying elapsed plus equals delta time. Well, delta time is a scaled time. So since I'm changing the time scale, this is then going to be incorrect. So there's actually an unscaled delta time, which is going to be important if I'm going to change the time scale here. There's our little animation to fade to white. Now, at some point, I need to fade back. Um, but in between, so once it fades to white, let's say I want to hold there for one second. So I can yield for one second. So it's going to stay at white for one second. Then I'll trigger a new game. And then I'll start fading back to, you know, I'll, I'll copy this whole thing again. And I'm going to instead fade from white to clear. So it's going to fade back out. Um, and then in this case, our time scale, we can set our time scale. Well, we don't need to animate the time scale. I think in new game, I'll just set the time scale. When you start a new game, the time scale is just going to get reset back to one. So we fade to white, wait one second, trigger a new game, and then we fade back out. And then at that point, the game will you know, be starting again. Oh um, yeah, we don't need to change our time scale. Um, so now we do need to reset elapse because that point elapse will already be finished. So we need to reset elapse back to zero again before we start our second animation. Oh, and then this should be wait for seconds real time because our time scale is going to be zero at that point. So we need real time otherwise or unscaled time. Otherwise, it's just going to sit there forever. All right, so we wait a second, we trigger a new game, then we fade back out to, you know, start playing our new game. Um, now we can start this coroutine and explode. So start coroutine, explode sequence. And is there anything else we should do? One thing we need to do when we start a new game is we need to clear the scene of all existing fruit and bombs. Anything in the scene, we need to clear those out. And we need to re-enable our blade and spawner. So here we should... Um, re-enable our blade and spawner to true reset our score reset the time scale let's reset the time scale first i guess it doesn't really matter um, and then we should clear our scene why don't we write a new function for this clear scene and we'll call that here so to clear the scene we can just search for all the fruit um, in the scene we can say find objects plural of type fruit. This is going to return an array. So we're getting an array of fruits, objects, plural. And we can then loop through each of these. For each fruit in fruits, we can then just destroy this. I mean, destroy the fruit.game object. Make sure you say destroy fruit.game object. Otherwise, you're just destroying the fruit script and not the game object as a whole. So we need to destroy the entire game object. Same exact thing for bombs. I'm just going to copy and paste this code and change this to um, bomb instead. Bomb, bomb, bomb. And we'll call this bombs. For each bomb and bombs, destroy bomb.game object. We destroy all fruits, destroy all bombs. We're kind of clearing the scene. That's all that should matter. New game, reset time scale, re enable our blade and spawner, reset score, clear the scene of all existing objects. And there we go. So we explode, we disable stuff, we start our animation for fading to white, we pause for a second, trigger a new game, then fade back out. Let's test this out. It's a nice little kind of simple sequence here. For your game, you might want to have like an actual game over menu and things like that. Um, but I'm just kind of showing you how you can sort of transition from a game over back to playing again. Um, but for a real game that you're looking to publish, it's probably you're gonna to want to do something different. Got a null reference exception. That's because I forgot to assign our reference to our imager. Go ahead and drag that in. Try again. All right. Let's get a bomb. And our score. Let's pay attention to our score too. We want to make sure that gets reset. Need a bomb, give me a bomb, please. I could just change the spawn chance to guarantee one. Let's just increase this. There we go, I got a bomb, fades to white, pauses for a second, fades back out, our score is zero, and now we can play again my, my bomb chance. Let's reset that, <laughs> all the bombs. 
And there we go, it triggered again. So that works. Great. So that's a very kind of simple um, kind of game over sequence. And it just immediately goes and starts the game up again. Um, but feel free to kind of come up with your own creative solution to that. All right, so at this point we have a fully working game of Fruit Ninja. I mean, obviously it's a very simple implementation of the game. There's a ton more we could do. Um, we could have custom fruit models, you know, we could have more effects, we can have menus and all that kind of stuff. But these are the core mechanics of the game that are kind of the most important. And now it's up to you to continue to build off of this and see how you can expand upon it add new features add new fruits and models and assets and maybe power-ups and things like that maybe you can slice a power up and you get you know something you could try to implement combos and stuff like that there's so many more things you can do um so i'd love to see what you come up with feel free to share your progress in our discord um in our discord server there's a link in the description of the video also just in general if you need any help implementing anything feel free to reach out to us in that in that uh, discord community i really appreciate you watching this tutorial and i hope you learned a thing or two along the way give the video a thumbs up or down to let me know how i did subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this one and leave a comment recommending what you would like to see next if you want to support my work even more you can become a patreon member to receive exclusive benefits including access to the unity assets that i develop link in the description of the video Thank you for watching. See you in the next one.